As I mentioned earlier, the biggest two ideas for you to take away from this inheritance lecture are polymorphism and dynamic binding. So before we get to the rules, uh, the precise rules about how to manipulate these two ideas, I will just like to give you some intuition. They are not that difficult to understand, uh, especially by using some appropriate example. I would like to do both of them uh, on, the, on my iPad. But definitely, if you go over the next few slides, you will definitely see the written form of my presentation. I think uh, you really want to combine them uh, together. Okay, so let me now switch to my iPad. Let's now do some exercise together. Right, I'm assuming that you we uh, you have already understood the expectation table very well based on the static types of the reference variable. That's really important. Okay, let me emphasize again: in order to really understand the intuition of polymorphism and dynamic binding, you definitely want to understand the expectation table based on the static types. Let's now go over polymorphism first and then dynamic binding. Let's just try to explain a little bit literal meaning about the two terms over here. Uh, for those of you who might be into the uh, the roots of uh, English words, so poly over here, I believe, is a Latin root. So poly simply means uh, multiple or multi. And I think a morphism over here simply means uh, shapes. Okay, uh, let me so different parts, shapes. So if you really try to analyze the literal meaning of polymorphism, it simply means multiple shapes. But multiple shapes of what? So you can think about it's really the multiple multiple shapes of a variable, like a like a uh, like a very vari reference variable that's declared with the some static type. Okay. So let me just give you uh, some intuition over here, some words for you to remember what polymorphism is really building uh, is really dealing with. Given a reference variable what does its static type the declare type allow you to reassign reassign it so it over here is simply the variable we're talking about. We assign it to. Okay, so what we are really focusing on is about the reassignments over here and given a particular static type. All right, so that's really the issue we are dealing with. So that's about polymorphism. Let me, <coughs> excuse me. Let me now move on to uh, the next one just to uh, explain a literal meaning first about dynamic binding. Okay. Dynamic binding here, uh, each term is actually quite um, quite a well-defined word, but if you put them together, what do they really mean? So when you talk about dynamic binding, it's really talking about which version of the method will be invoked at the runtime. So that's kind of the uh, issue we are dealing with by dynamic binding, but we'll see the example. Which version of the method of course, being invoked which version of the method will be invoked okay. and here the assumption is there are multiple versions multiple versions of the same method existing I'll give you one example right away. So you have this kind of multiple version uh, phenomenon, especially when you talk about inheritance. Okay, let me just highlight the keywords over here. So we are talking about which version is really important, given that there are multiple versions existing um, in, in the inheritance hierarchy. Let's say here, what about the get tuition method? How many versions of get tuition method do we have? We got version number one. We got the overridden version, version number two. We got another overridden version using discount rate, so version number three. We got one, two, and three. Three different versions. At the runtime, how do we determine which version is going to be invoked? All three versions are possible, but you got to determine exactly one version that's going to be invoked at the runtime. So that's the issue that dynamic binding is dealing with. All right. 
Let's now go back to polymorphism. Now that we understand kind of the literal meaning and what, and what kind of issue uh, polymorphism versus dynamic binding are dealing with, let's now give some concrete example to give you the intuition. Let's start with polymorphism, okay? Assuming that we know about this uh, inheritance hierarchy structure already, and also the expectation table, you will be now, uh, you will now be able to judge about polymorphism, okay? Let's now do one example here, okay? Let's say we got one student object over here, S, and it's simply a student, okay? And then we got another resident student's object, RS, over here, okay? And then we set the premium rates for the resident student to be 1.25, okay? Let's now visualize uh, these three lines quickly, okay? Let's see. So what I would do, uh, let me just do it uh, here. So you can see S, uh, let me just use the, to be consistent with color. So for S, I'm gonna use a green, and for RS, I'm gonna use uh, red, like a pink, okay? So what we have is, you can see S is pointing to a student object over here, okay? Let me now just omit the detail for the attributes, just for now, okay? That's a student's objects, and also RS, we know from before that it's going to have more expectation because it inherits not only the attributes from the parent class, but also it defines new attributes. So this will be the resident student's class, right? resident student objects, right? Because we're invoking this uh, resident student constructor. So that'll be resident students. We got more attributes as well. Now we got two references, uh, reference variable RS and also RS. Their static types are students and resident students respectively. And we can set the RS, that, uh, the set premium rate to be 1.25. So one of the attributes for RS would be the premium rates. Let me put it here at the bottom. So premium rates is simply 1.25. Okay, like that. Now here's a question for you. And you can pause the video and think about it. We got two possible assignments over here. Either you say S is assigned to RS, or you say RS is assigned to S. Question for you. Which one is valid? Is this valid? Or is this valid? Or both of them are valid? Or none of them is uh, is valid? When I say valid, I simply mean, do they compile? Does this line compile? Does this line compile? Do both of them compile? Or none of them compiles? So there are four possibilities. You tell me which one it is. All right, pause the video and think about it. Okay, assuming that you thought about it, I would say for those of you who didn't really get exposed to inheritance, uh, it's uh, challenging for you because you have to make a, a maybe educate, uh, educated guess. But for those of you who actually study about inheritance in the earlier, for your earlier OOP experience, you might know what the answer is, but can you really explain to me why? For example, I can tell you what the answer is. The answer is this one is valid. On the other hand, this one over here, uh, let me just use the, uh, say this one is valid. On the other hand, this one over here is not valid. For those of you who actually already know the answer, could you actually explain to me precisely why? Number five over here wouldn't compile. Okay, so this line over here will not compile. Will simply fail to compile. Can you justify to me with uh, maybe some intuitive reason? All right, that's exactly why I want to give you the intuition, uh, intuition right away, okay? Let's now th uh, think about it. Uh, well, you don't need to. Let me uh, let me just walk you through the reasoning, okay? Basically, let's now, first of all, let's see. We say S, when you try to do S, is assigned to RS. S, we know that, what's its static type? The static type for S is simply just students, right? which is here in the hierarchy. On the other hand, we got RS over here. What's its declare and static type? So the static type is simply resident students over here, right? It's a resident students, resident students, which is over here, okay? And I'm saying that if you're trying to assign a variable whose static type is actually a parent of another variable whose, uh, whose static type is actually the subclass, it will be invalid. But why? It boils down into expectation. 
Okay, let's now try to do this reasoning a little bit more formally. So what I would do is I would like to do proof by contradiction. Okay, let me write it down and then I'll tell you how it works. And that's something you, you would have learned already in your math class. Let's just uh, now do a very simple application of proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction. And let me remind you quickly about how the proof by contradiction will actually work. Basically, uh, if you want to prove that something would not be valid, why, why don't we simply assume it is valid? And then assuming that it is valid, we're going to make some inference from there. And we're going to uh, make some arguments based on the uh, assumption. And then there will be some conclusion we can infer that will prove uh, that will turn out to be contradictory or disaster in, more informally. And because having the initial assumption will lead to disaster, that means our initial assumption that this is actually valid must be false. So that means it must be invalid. So that's the proof by contradiction. Let's now go over step by step care, uh, carefully. Okay, number one, we're going to assume that R S is assigned to S is valid, meaning that it will compile. And starting from step number two. We're actually going to somehow show some inference from there, some arguments that will eventually lead to disaster. And then, so that means our initial assumption must be the opposite. Uh, our, uh, the, uh, uh, our initial assumption should be the opposite to the truth, meaning that this one should not compile in the first place. Okay, that's uh, kind of the logic. Hopefully, you, hopefully you're follow, following me. Okay, so now for number two, how should we go on? Let me now talk about the uh, expectation, okay? Can we just talk about expectation quickly? Let me just put the step number two over here. Okay, step number two, the expectation for the variables. Okay, what's the expectation for S? And also, what's the expectation for RS? Okay, and uh, we're just trying to fill in part of the table that we spoke about, right? For S, it's going to be basically register get tuition and also the name and also courses and NOC because S for its a uh, static type is simply just students over here right so it's going to be let me just put uh, put it down register method get tuition and also the name and also we got courses uh, we got uh, NOC right also we got courses and also we got NOC so these are all the expectation for the static type students over here. Similarly, what will be the expectation for RS, whose declared static type is resident students? What will be its uh, expectation? In that case, why don't we write, uh, well, definitely it will inherit all the attributes and methods from its parents. It's going to be register, get tuition, the name, and also courses, NOC, right? All of these are simply just common. So hopefully you have no issue with them, right? Courses NOC, so all of them are okay. In addition to it, what we can expect on ARS variable over here, okay, let me just put the pink. That might be better. So what we can expect are, uh, on RS in addition to whatever that's inherited from the students, it will be whatever that's specific to resident students. For example, premium rates and also set premium rates. So these are specific to resident student expectation, right? So more precisely, so these two are resident student specific, resident students specific expectation. It is something that we know already. You can think about it as more like a, um, more like an axiom. That's something we, we know, that's for sure, uh, the definition for expectation. All right, so now let, let me now go, now go for step number three. Okay, since we assume that uh, this uh, this particular assignment is going to be valid, so now let's execute the assignments. Let's now simply execute the assignments. Execute RS is assigned to S. And what's going to happen? Well, we know that it's going to uh, redirect. It's going to redirect RS so that rs is going to point to wherever s is pointing to right 
redirecting rs and then let it point to wherever s is pointing to so this is basically step number three okay just to remind you okay and that's going to be the assignments and now i'm not sure if you can already look ahead to see what uh what i'm uh, actually going to lead to how i'm going to lead to disaster by doing this okay and now after this let's now go for step number four after executing that uh, reference assignment so now let's now uh, let me let me use uh, now for now let me use purple to explain to you how the disaster how the disaster can actually happen we know that rs part of its expectation is simply set premium rates right so now why don't we try to call the following if i say rs dot set premium rates and then 1.5 for example now what's going to happen is it really going to work the answer is no because if it's an rs dot that means you're going to follow through the pointer at the runtime and find out this is the objects for rs does that objects over there of type students right you can see uh, that was uh, that was initially created as a student objects does that objects contain any premium rates attributes for you to set the answer is no if you don't have such attributes that means the attribute is undefined if you're trying to set the value 1.5 to something that's undefined you're going to crash the program okay let me just put it down over here does not include hopefully you're following my logic here i'm trying to go very slowly over here does not include attributes premium rates over here and if you re, uh, recall the visualization we did earlier let me just show to you you can see the student class over here the student objects it, it does have name number of courses register courses it does not have premium rates so if you try to set a premium rate for the student objects you're going to crash because the attribute premium rate is undefined okay let's now go back over here and then so that means what's going to happen is the consequence is we're going to have a crash because the premium rates is undefined on the students objects okay so based on number four well, since we let uh, we actually led to this uh, disaster so now that's why for number five the conclusion is the opposite to one should be true should be true meaning that rs is assigned to s should really fail to compile should be invalid okay so that's the uh, how, how we can prove it if you if you wish the reason that i want to show you this proof is because later on once we actually show you the rule for so-called variable substitution you can simply memorize the rule that's true however it, it might count to one day that you actually forgot about the rules in which case what would be the most logical way for you to recall the rule this proof would be the the uh, best way for you to recall that's why i'm showing you the proof all right so guys so that's about why this particular uh reference variable assignment here is actually should be invalid we did it by proof by we did it by uh the proof by contradiction over here right you can argue in a very similar way why this would be okay uh s is assigned to rs right in this case what we're doing is uh rs let me just say a little bit more rs over here we know that the static type is actually resident students and s over here the static type is actually students okay so we are talking we are assigning some resident students objects into a variable that has the expectation for students can a resident students objects fulfill the expectation for students the answer is yes let me write it down so this assignment over here is really asking about over here can a resident students objects fulfill or satisfy let me say fulfill the expectation of students oh uh, sorry uh yeah student for sure expectation of students the answer is yes 
On the other hand, can a student's objects fulfill the expectation of a non -res uh, of a resident student? In that in that case, no. Because in the case of premium rates, you just cannot satisfy that. In that case, you will simply need to uh, lead to a crash. Okay, so that's about what I want to uh, discuss about uh, the intuition. Hopefully, that's just uh, uh, thorough enough for you. But you can definitely go back to the slides. I also explain in both cases about valid and invalid as, as well in the slides. But hopefully, you get an intuition.